I got into a strategy and corporate development role. I went from kind of sales and marketing into strategy and corporate development. And we did, I spent two years doing a couple different deals, doing everything from sourcing opportunities to diligence to closing deals. We sold the business to a private equity firm. Um, I was working with bankers and lawyers, and it kind of took me back to my campaign days, right? Because when you're doing a deal, as you guys know, it's the same thing, right? It's this frenetic pace of 100%. activity from you know the time that you sign that uh, you know that that LOI to the sign that you get it actually closed. The diligence is a is a really in, in depth process, but it's got to be exacting. All right, I want to talk to you for a moment about retaining and developing your workforce. It's hard. Recruiting is hard. Retaining top employees is hard. Then you've got onboarding, payroll, benefits, time and labor management. You need to take care of your workforce and you can only do this successfully if you commit to transforming your employee experience. This is where ISOF comes in. They empower you to be successful. We've seen it with a number of companies that we've worked with and this is why we partner with them here at WorkDefined. We trust them and you should too. Check them out at isolvedhcm.com. This episode is brought to you by La Quinta by Wyndham. Your work can take you all over the place, like Texas. You've never been, but it's going to be great because you're staying at La Quinta by Wyndham. Their free bright side breakfast will give you energy for the day ahead. And after, you can unwind using their free high-speed Wi-Fi. Tonight, La Quinta. Tomorrow, you shine. Book your stay today at LQ.com. Right. Hey, this is William Tidcup and Ryan Leary. You are listening and watching Inside the C-Suite. We've got Dan on uh, from Accurate, and uh, we're going to learn all about his journey to the C-Suite. So we've known Dan for a while, done some work with him, and uh, but we don't know anything about his journey. So uh, we're along for the ride as well. So Dan, would you do us a favor and introduce yourself and kind of what you're doing now? Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, super excited to be here. William, Ryan, thank you guys for having me. Sure. Um, I am currently the Chief Revenue Officer at Accurate, and we're a global provider of employment screening services. And um, I have the pleasure of working with our full go-to-market team. So everything from marketing to sales, onboarding, implementation, customer service, account management, a couple hundred employees uh, worldwide. So Chief Revenue Officer... That's uh, new-ish, I guess, because uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a C-suite position, and the way that y'all have it structured, I would assume you've got marketing, go-to-market. You've got everything under, the, under you. Yeah. It's, um, our CEO, Tim Dodd, was very you know, sort of exacting in the way he wanted to structure right. the team. So he wanted right. to have, like, our COO has everything on the, on the back office side, so operations, right. technology, development. Right. And then I've got everything on the front office. So essentially, I get the chance to work with the team and kind of manage the whole customer journey, right? From how we go out to market and reach clients and prospects, how we communicate with them, how we sell to them, how we support them. So it's um, it's it's been interesting. I mean, so your I love, team, you you have customers as well. Yeah, yeah. So I have our account management team as okay. well as our customer service team. So all of the wow. interactions with our clients and with their candidates are that account. helps. I yeah. think that helps. That's closed loop, closed loop, because okay. I, yeah, if customers are also people that you upsell. So there's a sales component as well as a support and kind of all the other things that they need. So I actually, I like that. I, you know, every, every model is a little bit different. You go into some organization, they've got sales, they've got marketing. Yeah. And then, you know, there's a whole lot of blame going both, both directions. And so I kind of like the buck stops with you in this model. If it, if it deals with revenue, it lands on your desk. Completely. And the one thing I really like is the relationship between marketing and sales. You know, that's kind of like this historical cat and dog relationship, right, within the corporate world. Um, and having both of those teams completely aligned has been right. fantastic. I mean, it just as, you know, we've, we've kind of lowered all of those silos that are, you know, you historically see between sales and marketing said, so like, guys, we're in this together to grow the business. So right. it's been great. Great. So, Dan, I love the story of today, but I love even more the story of how you got here. 
<laughs> which is All obviously right. the purpose of the CSV, right? So let's yeah. let's let's travel back into time. Let's let's start digging in. We don't have to go to infant or toddler stage, but <laughs> <laughs> we're going at a walk. Those yeah, were like, critical years, though, Ryan. So. I understand. They 100%. were critical years. What was your first word? Let's start there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you even remember your first word? Uh, I don't. No. Uh, I'm sure my mother, who is 91, will tell me, though, if I, yes. oh, I communicate. You got good genes. You'll be around. 100%. You'll be around. So, so, let's, so, so tell, us, tell us about Little Dad. How did you get started uh, in business? What's your story? So um, my story really began, I would say, um, I mean, like everyone probably with Lee, within but kind of late high school, college. So in high school, I was almost a dropout. Um, I <laughs> barely got out of high school. I mean, I feel like I've heard this story. <laughs> we're similar stories. Very good. I, I, I tell people I, was, I graduated 25th in my class. There was 900 <laughs> students. And people are like, man, that's awesome. Like uh, from the bottom. <laughs> yes. Well, William, you and I were in a very similar position. So yeah. I had a lot of fun in high school, had some yeah. really great friends, um, spent a lot of time, uh, as I kind of affectionately call smoking and joking. We did a lot of smoking uh -huh. and joking. 100%. And, um, mistakes were made. Yeah. Mistakes were made, but, <laughs> but a lot of lessons were learned too, right? So I think, you know, and I kind of got a lot of that, got a lot of that out of my system in high school. So I barely got into college, and I followed a good friend of mine to a real small school in the middle of in Missouri. I grew up outside D.C. and Virginia, and and um, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do. So someone told me, like, hey, you should just – you study something you really love, and I love yeah. geography. I am a – I am a, you can probably see this map and on the so back. Say the map I was about to say. <laughs> I, am, I am just passionate about um, – geopolitical issues, geo like economic issues, cultures. I'm just passionate about that. So I was like, okay, I'm going to study that. No clue like what that would do for me you know, after that. Um, yep. So I spent two years in Missouri, decided that's not where I wanted to be. I took some time off, went to community college, and then got into Virginia Tech, which is where I wanted yeah. to graduate from, which had a really Great good school. program, kind of moving up the ladder academically, which was good. Um, and then I realized I really wanted to be in, in politics and policy. So my mother was a big influence on that. She'd always been involved in politics at a grassroots level, and she was a huge influence on me and me and that. And so I did some internships on the Hill. Um, I did some internships with campaigns. And when I graduated from tech, uh, I jumped into political campaigns in Virginia. And I was in retail politics for about three years in a variety of different roles, um, Campaign manager, political director, um, on on congressional races, local so, state house. So you got races. to see how the sausage is made. Oh yeah, so I got to, yes. And what <laughs> I loved about being in, in retail politics is your job is different literally every day, right? right? One day, one day you are talking to the press. You're talking to the Washington Post. You're talking like Peter Baker at the Washington yeah. Post. Wow. The next day you are handing out literature at a, a high school football game. Right. You know, like vote for Gary Jones. The next day you're at a, you know, you're at a high dollar fundraiser meeting Newt Gingrich or, you know, governor so-and-so. And then the next day you're blowing up, blowing up balloons at an event. You know, so it's you literally have this compressed time. You know, right. because the campaign is only it's typically six months long. And every day you have like 100 things to do. You wear 100 different hats. And I and you got a lot of volunteers to manage as well. You have a lot of volunteers to manage. So, you which got is money. Oh yeah. yeah. Now, when you and, say retail politics, just for uh, well, for me actually, and probably some of the uh, audience as well, what does that mean? So that's really campaign politics, like campaign. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Got it. So you're so you and you also have to put your marketing sales hat on, right? Oh I mean, yeah. That is a lot. A lot of that is about you know selling the candidate and selling the vision and and all of those things. So I love that. Um, about three years into it, I became, well, one, we lost a lot. So I was not, <laughs> I was not very fortunate. Like the goal in, in, in <laughs> campaign politics is you win and then yeah. you leverage that into that into some great job, right? 100%. Um, you follow, 100%. You know, so, so and did, so to that great job. I was not you, fortunate enough to have a lot of those tracks. Did you pick <laughs> the wrong candidate? a little bit less. What's that? 
did you pick the wrong candidates or you were just bad at your job? Yeah. <laughs> honest question. That's an wow. honest question. Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's a good you, question. Did, could you just I mean, suck is this, less? Is this, is this a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> could you just suck <laughs> a little bit of both. Okay. Um, you picked the wrong horse. And <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I picked some, I mean, honestly, I worked for some amazing people. Um, but what I saw was that um, this was kind of the rise in the early 90s, the rise of the political consultant. And the political oh, yeah. consultant would come in and take the candidate and essentially reposition the candidate the way right. in which they think that they were going to win. Right. Sometimes that worked, sometimes it didn't. So I, I started to sort of see, as you were saying, William, earlier, earlier, like how the sausage was made, and I became yeah. a little less idealistic. And oh, 100%. I saw people getting changed, you know, sort of like, for instance, I, I worked for this guy in North Carolina. Um, he was running for governor in a gubernatorial primary. He was the former mayor of Charlotte, the right. largest city in North Carolina. He played basketball under Dean Smith. So... I mean, talk about credentials. And when he was 19, he walked down to his local army recruiting station and volunteered to go to the Vietnam, to go to Vietnam, won the bronze star. I mean, he had this amazing story, amazing story, yeah. just, a, a, just a wonderful person. And it was a great example of how, you know, people came in and made him into something that he was not. And, right. and he lost. And I think that was kind of like my last, like, okay, I'm done with this. And that's when I kind of got more passionate about public policy policy. And I like, okay, I get the politics, I get the political side, but I really am more interested in how do we create good policy and how can I be involved in that? And so I worked as a lobbyist for a while for an aviation trade association in DC. Yeah. And then I spent three years working for the governor in Virginia as, um, which, which governor? Uh, Jim Gilmore. So it yeah, was okay. the mid mid nineties. Yeah, and, it was before um, Warren. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was it was um, right after Governor Allen and before yeah. I can't remember. The, anyway, back then it was pretty much Virginia was pretty much Democrat, right? It was an evolving. It was kind of like the an evolving, more of an evolving uh, red state. I would say. I hate to use really. That. Stuff. But it was yeah, becoming yeah. more of a. It was becoming more conservative. Like the blue dog Democrats were starting to lose. Right. The national picture was changing. Yep. Um, and it was an, ama an amazing experience. I mean, working working in the governor's office, working for the secretary. I was at that time. I was working for the secretary of transportation. We had like you know five state agencies, billion plus dollar budget. You know, I was in constantly debriefing her and the governor and working with state legislators. I mean, it was just an amazing job. That's um, cool. Yeah. And so that was a, a great, a, just a great experience of, of just working at kind of that executive level. And, you know, it seems like there's sales in, in both of these things, right? So in, in the politics of uh, obviously the, the retail politics say you're selling. Yeah, whether or not we want to call it that or not, but you're 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 so you're sales and marketing, you're actually positioning, you're doing all that stuff, and even in policy, there's an element of sales uh, of getting people on the same page, right? Just like marketing real building consensus. Mm -hmm. So, so you're honing your sales skills way before sales even enters the pictures. Yeah, no doubt about it, and I think you're right. Your your positioning. Your your selling ideas. You're out in the marketplace too, you know, talking yeah. to constituents about is this something that they like or they don't like, or you know, and and so there's there's a lot of those elements. Um, there was a lot of communication opportunities for me. I'd go out and speak on behalf of the governor and at events, and you know, I do like the ribbon cutting ceremonies of this, you know, this new bypass <laughs> and you know this new bridge, and you know that was that's it was, cool. It was, yeah, it was amazing interacting with the press. Huh. Um, you know, when you're 24 and you get an opportunity to sit down with a, a chief executive of a state and debrief them, um, you know, fly with them to D.C. or events or, you know, just the exposure was great. Right. Right. I mean, it was about really kind of instilling confidence in your ideas and right. instilling confidence in how you communicate. And I think those were things that were just pivotal for me. 
for all of my next steps, you know, just to yeah. when you kind of get the confidence of being in the room, you know, that's such a huge, you know, sort of a huge barrier to overcome. Uh, right. How did you how did you get that confidence? So you're almost a high school dropout. You barely get through college. <laughs> Right. I, I mean, I'm, ta- I'm talking about the yeah. good stuff here. Wow. Right? That's I, think, I think I had a 2 five. Let's be honest. I think it was a 2 five. So. That's, that's, that's good. Just, that's probably where I was, right? So I'm about there. Yeah. <laughs> Look at us. Um, but the- I did take Spanish one, I think, at least twice. But oh, I think 100%. It was a two five. There you go. There it took you like go. six years of Spanish. I said, I don't know any other words. <laughs> Google Translate. Well, yeah. So, so you're 24. You're sitting in front of the chief executive of your, of your, uh, of your state, right? So, how how do you do this? How do you, how do you sit there yeah. and, as 24 and how do you look him in the eye and say you need to listen to me? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's all about, in my mind, it's all about preparation, and right. it's all about you know just being prepared and anticipating questions. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I work with some amazing people, obviously a lot of lawyers, um, but just a lot of people who have been in politics and policy for a long time. And you watch and learn. Um, I'm definitely someone that likes to listen more than speak. And so I spent a lot of time my first probably six months, you know, at, on the sideline, just listening um, yeah. and just sort of watching how he liked to be debriefed. Um, but it really is all about preparation, right? And and being the more prepared you are, obvious point, the more confident you mm-hmm. are in what you're saying. Um, and it is all about anticipating what that next question is, because he was the attorney general, so he was a, you know, he was an attorney by trade, right? And so we all know when you're talking to attorneys, you know, they can they they like to talk one, and they like to question and they like to poke holes in your line of reasoning. And so when you're going in and talking to someone about why you should sign this bill or why you should support this, you know, policy, you need to be prepared for really more of the downside than the upside, right? Mm. Uh, because that's kind of where he was going to go in the conversation. So I really hone my skills about being prepared. And all it takes is going into one of those conversations and not being prepared to learn. That you need to be prepared. Right. <laughs> you yeah. don't get one shot. Exactly. <laughs> so um, I did that for three years, and um, I, I really wanted to stay in, trans- in transportation policy. I loved it. It had like the, the, the sort of the geopolitical elements to it. Um, I loved that it was pretty a not pretty nonpartisan, you know. Right, right. Um, and I was I was actually in, in Virginia. The governor can only serve one term, so he's a very powerful governor, but they can only serve one term. Right. And at that time, I was then going to go into the Bush administration in a DOT job, and I was really excited about that. And the guy that I was going to potentially work for, his um, nomination was being held up in the Senate for whatever reason. And so as his nomination was being held up and being held up at the same time, I was out of a job. My wife was pregnant with our first child and I was starting to get nervous and she wanted to, you know, stay at home. And so I got this, you know, kind of call from um, a friend who was like, Hey, like, Hey, there's this company that's looking for someone to build out kind of uh, this is po- right post nine 11. Right build out a um, sort of a, a government marketing arm of this background screening business that's really solid in the transportation space. They were, they were, at the time, they were called DAC Services. And the person was Billy Lee, who was the person that was that I talked to was going to hire me. And I was like, okay, I'll take this job and yeah, yeah. You know, we'll move from it's Richmond temp- back up to D.C. And, it's you know, temporary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll wait on the sidelines until this guy gets, you know, can confirm. Little did you know. I'll jump back into this, you know, great public policy career that I had planned. Um, and, you know, obviously, as they say, the rest is history. But as I jumped into, you know, sort of the the business side, the private, the commercial side, I just sort of fell in love. I mean, I fell in love with all of the things that I had learned that we were talking about, like in sales, sales and marketing, how I could use those, you know, to my advantage in the commercial side, going out and talking to, at this time, we were talking to federal and state agencies about how we could help them vet 
everything from hazmat drivers to right. you know all of the things that they were trying to do to create a more secure transportation infrastructure post 9-11. So loved it. Absolutely loved it. What were their, their needs at that point? Was it, what were they, the criminal record, drug testing, and safety? Like what, what was the things that drove them to either screen people in or screen people out, whatever your perspective is, but like what drove their decisions? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was definitely, they were looking for obviously criminal history. Um, yeah. I mean, they were really interested in understanding the background of individuals that were, I mean, obviously you had in such a scenario where these people hijacked planes and crashed them into buildings. So Fair enough. We probably, got a height, get, probably a heightened sense at that point. Yeah, we got to get a sense of who are these people that are on the road and, and especially folks that are traveling with. Back then, did all contractors also, you know, if you if you contracted with the state, you also had to go through screening? Because um, that, that happened at one point, or at least here it did, in Texas it did. Yeah, there were some programs that did that where they right. decided that they, they wanted to make sure that there was vetting across. Even a private you company. Access to state facilities and things right. like that. Yeah. No doubt. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. So I got into this gig in kind of a marketing and sales role. And this business was uh, private equity owned and it was bought pretty soon after that by a larger company that was doing um, background investigations in the federal government, this company called USIS. And, and this episode is brought to you by ShipStation. If you run an e-commerce business, you know how much work it takes to produce something great while dealing with complicated shipping issues. That's why over 130,000 companies have turned to ShipStation, an innovative tool that allows you to focus less on shipping and more on building your brand. With ShipStation, you can manage orders, label printing, reporting, and customer service on one easy-to-use dashboard. You'll reduce warehouse costs with reliable enterprise solutions and save thousands on shipping costs with discounts up to 89% off. Plus, you can effortlessly import orders from everywhere you sell online. So, turn your shipping challenges into opportunities for growth. Go to ShipStation.com and use code POD to sign up for your free 60-day trial. That's ShipStation.com, code POD. Then I just sort of decided, well, now I need to sort of start to craft a plan. Like, what what do I really <laughs> want to do? And I am, um, I am a planner. So don't, yeah. like, everything that I told you, like, going from... <laughs> there was intention. Barely getting out of high school. Yeah, uh -oh. <laughs> but when I did get barely out of high school and got into college, when I got into college, I realized, okay, now I got to start to think about what I want to do. High gotta, college, right? You just got to start putting gotta, something, together. Put something together. Well, the moment you said your wife was pregnant, it's, at that point, it probably is like, I, I need to kind of, I got yeah. 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 I mean, got to sell her a plan. <laughs> we may not be talking to you today if your wife weren't pregnant and the Good Senate point. wasn't holding up the nomination. That's right. That's we may That's not even exactly know who right. you are. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. And and roads are not blue or red. That's one of the best things about that particular area of politics is infrastructure. Everybody everybody cares about it. Everybody does, yeah. Which yeah. was which was so much fun to work in because of Yeah. Um, and you also saw the fruit of your labor, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. You can you point can, to it. You can you can literally deliver something. You know, yeah. it's, not, it's, it's not like yeah. It's not a es it's not an esoteric, which yes. a lot of that stuff can be esoteric and transitory, meaning it doesn't stay. One regime will have it, then the next regime will wipe it out. It just kind of goes back and forth. When you build a bridge over a river, bridge isn't going anywhere. <laughs> bridge, is gonna, bridge is going to stay there. I mean, it could go somewhere, and we hope it does. Good point, take. Good That's point. True. Well, point two taken. of the biggest projects I've worked with, and you guys have probably been in the DC area many times. Oh yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. was the new Woodrow Wilson Bridge. So yep. mm -hmm. we opened that um, and worked very closely with Maryland and D.C. on that wow. project. And then, like, there's this interchange. It's called the Springfield Interchange, where 395, 95, and the Beltway meet, which was a massive project. Oh, yeah. Well. Um, and then um, Metro out to Dulles. So those were three projects that we worked really closely on. And again, it's kind of one of wow. those things like, I mean, I wasn't, you know, pivotal to any of them, but I was involved right. in them. But it, to right. point, it's like you can see 
like these things made a big difference, obviously, in the infrastructure in that area. I did. Uh, I spent three summers in D.C. on internships with uh, the Smithsonian's, uh, two of them were Smithsonian's in a national park. So I was there. Now, this would be the 90s. It would be yeah. late 90s and late 90s. I was there without a car using the metro to go everywhere. Great so, system. Yeah. I loved, yeah, I loved it. The uh, when you were when you were doing the lobbying, what is is that K Street that has all the lobbyists? Like, what's the street that has all the lobbyists? Yeah, K Street is the street. The street, although our shop was not on K Street. <laughs> well, the rent rent's we a little were, high on K yeah, Street. Yeah, exactly. We were we were a little smaller, <laughs> um, but but yeah, everyone goes from like Capitol Hill to K Street. Oh yeah, back. there's and, some bars yeah. and restaurants along the way in between those two places that it's. It's it's all politicians. Yeah. So, completely. yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. When you mentioned private investigation, I, I want to make sure that I understand the the background of background screening. In, in what I've been told, when it was first started, it was PIs, it was private investigators. Mm -hmm. They would do a lot of manual. Yeah. You know, they'd go out and follow a person. They'd go out, you know, question the neighbors. You know, like typical PI work. They'd go and do all that stuff to find out what was there, then they'd build a report. So the whole whole thing was manual and it was, you know, human centric. There wasn't technology. It was no. like, Billy's gonna go follow up a, a, a person that you're thinking about hiring, you know, and uh and if he can dig up anything about you should do this, then he's gonna put it in a report. That's it. Now that's dated, obviously, because it's it's much different now. But uh what part of that spectrum did you come in on? Were there still PIs involved when you first started? Yeah, uh, not really. So right. when I first started, um, the the industry was still extremely fragmented, but <laughs> they were, you know, we were doing a lot of work via fax, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, we had very thin, yeah, we did have some yeah, we did. We had technology platforms that yeah. you know, people could order and see results and right. see status, but they were yeah, super basic. But like, you know, think about gathering records from courthouses, like you know, four thousand courthouses around the country. Oh, I mean, oh, this yeah. was all like that. Fact, digital, fact. digital, or they aren't digitalized. Yeah, fax and mail. So there yeah. was huge mail and fax operations um, to get that information, which obviously has changed significantly. Over what the was the turnaround on a on a screen in in number of hours or days at, at when you first started? It was at least five days, I would think. <laughs> I wanted people to hear that because they're like, I don't know <laughs> screening to it. It's not happening fast enough. We're like, well, uh, you don't understand where we've come from. And, and how many <laughs> how many of these people got through that shouldn't have gotten through with yeah. that manual effort? Oh, I mean, yeah, shortcuts were probably made. Yeah, good yeah. point. Huh. And then on the Five government days. side, it, it was, it, and it still is, very much more of an investigation. Yes. Because if you if you were going to get a security clearance at yeah. – the Department of Defense, we actually had an investigator that had your case and they would go out and interview you and they would interview your your, your employer. They would interview your neighbors. Oh, yeah. They would interview your uh, references and um, they would create a report. Uh, so that was a much more in-depth process than, you know, kind of on the commercial side. Right. So when I started at USIS, um, I got quickly into um, not just sales, but then I was interested in strategy. Um, I started to become really fascinated by business strategy. And at the same time, I decided, you know what, I think I'm going to go back to school and get an MBA because I didn't have, and I had thought about going back to school to get a law degree. And then someone with people were telling me like, do you want to be a lawyer? I was like, no, I don't. And I like, then don't pursue that. But I was <laughs> looking for I was looking for something that would kind of amplify my knowledge. 100%. You know, coming out of this, mm -hmm. I was in politics and policy, and then I wanted to, you know, sort of get this amplification going into business. And so yeah. I went back to school, got an MBA, and got super interested in a couple of things. One was did you, strategy. Did you take two years off and went and did a full-time program? Or did I you did a part-time program. Yeah, that's hard. And when I started, I had my second child. Oh um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> and then when I ended, I had my third. Um, 
That so, is so people don't know how difficult that is to juggle work, family, sure. and the NBA because yeah. it's not like they it's not like they lessen the uh, the program. That's what you, no. that's what most people don't know when they say, "Oh, I'm going to do my NBA part time." Like you understand that the full time two year pro- program for most students <laughs> it's killer. Like mm-hmm. it, it's designed to kill you for the whole bit. Is a gauntlet. Like they don't, they don't make it like halfway for the part-time people. They're like, you know, it's the same. It's well, the, well, the same at this, syllabus. Time, at this time too, I got tapped to go out to, of all places, Tulsa, Oklahoma on, ah. a, on a weekly basis to run their marketing team. So okay, we had this commercial screening business that was in transition and, um, I was tapped to do this for six months. And so I was getting on a plane every Monday, flying out there, doing homework on at a hotel and doing it on a plane. And oh, yeah. as you were saying, like balancing time with your young mm-hmm. kids. And um, it was a, yeah, it was a, it was an interesting sort of two years. But in that two year, the program that I went to had an international focus. And so right. we did these um, kind of capstone projects. One was in Turkey, one was in India where we had, um, we did consulting work for companies. We did consulting work for Infosys in India, which at that time was like yep. this small BPO. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Um, I got a chance to go, o- go overseas and, again, kind of rekindled my love for geography and culture and people. And I got so interested in like, wow, like this is a different market and there's different buyers and there's different ways to market to them. And and I just love that challenge. And so at that time, I was like, okay, I definitely want to do something overseas at some point. Like I was just in the back of my head. I was like, I got to do that. Um, so I got into a strategy and corporate development role. I went from kind of sales and marketing into strategy and corporate development. And we did, I spent two years doing a couple different deals, doing everything from sourcing opportunities to diligence to closing deals. We sold the business to a private equity firm. Um, I was working with bankers and lawyers, and it kind of took me back to my campaign days, right? Because when you're doing a deal, as you guys know, it's the same thing, right? It's this frenetic pace of 100%. activity from you know the time that you sign that uh, you know, that, that LOI to the sign that you get it actually closed. The diligence is a, is a really in, in-depth process, but it's gotta be exacting, right? Oh yeah. yeah. Somebody thing. has to set the clock. Cause if someone doesn't set the clock, it could take two years to get a deal done. Yes. So someone, uh, you know, you, it's different people in different cases, but someone has to say, Hey, this thing's gotta be wrapped up and done by April 1st period. And, and all you of a sudden, it's, out, you got to like, you got to fair out all the risk in it. Oh so, yeah, oh yeah. I, I loved it. I loved the pace of that, um, and then I loved the integration piece too because I'm, I really became passionate about just sort of this idea of change management. And so we did that for three years, and then I, I was, it was critical for me at that time. I was like, you know what, I want to be a CEO. Like that's what I want to do. I want to run a business. And so I had some good mentors at that time who said, well, you need to start to get you know, P&L roles under your belt. And so I took my, I, I started my first um, foray into P&L experience and I ran a business unit in Chicago. We had about 300 employees, about $70 million in revenue. And we moved the family from DC to Chicago and did that for two years and loved it. Um, loved building the team, loved building the strategy, loved interacting with our clients, loved interacting with our employees, um, and just really fell in love with this. Like the, the thing that I thought I was going to really love about it, I, it was just sort of emphasized to me in that, right? Because it, when you're a P&L owner or a general manager, you get to see it all, right? Yep. You're not you know, you don't get kind of pigeonholed into one functional area. And I liked that because I, yeah. I, I lack patience. That's my, probably my biggest vice. <laughs> and so at that same time, I was thinking like, okay, how do I get overseas? And I was talking to um, a, 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 the CEO at the time of Hire, Hire Right. Yep. And he was like, you know what? We're thinking about buying these businesses overseas and, you know, maybe there's a, a role here for you. And I pursued that heavily. I said, oh, yeah. I, I want to do this job for you. And so 
I got the job to be the international, so the global GM. And uh, the were, they CEO public? Time, were they public at the time? Or no, they, they, had were public? Actually, they had they had gone from public to private, right. and then they were purchased. Right. And um, when he was telling me, well, the, jo- the job's going to be based in California. And I said, well, you know, mm. you can't really run a business outside the U.S. This is L.A., yeah. In California. <laughs> and so I said, what I really want to do is I want to I want to go to London, integrate these businesses, and build out the business outside the U.S., geographically outside the U.S. And he was like, great, you should do, you should do that. Do you? <laughs> so move the family. We had, at that time, we had four kids. We moved the family from Chicago to, to central London. Your wife didn't live. say just go and do this and come home on the weekend. Yeah, no. <laughs> like that was a non-starter. Yeah, that was a non-starter. Yeah. <laughs> so we lived in central London in Paddington uh, on yep. Bayswater Road in the middle of it all, and we had um, it was an interesting time because we had bought two businesses and they were both fierce competitors of each other. <laughs> so, the, so the the integration challenge was. Huh. How do you integrate these businesses that in are America, and an American together? being the arbiter they of these two things? Yes. Exactly. <laughs> they hate each other. They could have done it better themselves, quicker than themselves, without the American involved. Oh, no. Fierce competitors. So I was over, so moved over to London, to London um, and just fell in love with this idea of how do you build a business outside the U.S. because it was just everything was new, right? I mean, and you guys know this, you know, we're, 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 we're a, we have the same language, but we don't, right? I, don't, right. I can't remember what it's very but, different. you know, it's, we're, yeah, we've, we've butchered their language actually. <laughs> completely. There's so much different about doing business in the U.K. and then expanding in, into Europe and, and then eventually into Asia. And so, we integrated the businesses. I started to build the team there. Um, I was a daily commuter into into central London on the team. Wow. We were traveling all over Europe as a family. My kids were going to a little primary school in Marylebone on the high street. And um, I was just like a sponge, like just absorbing all of these different, you know, opportunities and um like I would, kid, I would kid with my colleagues. I'd be like, yeah, you're going to a client meeting in Cleveland. I'm going to a client meeting in Geneva. So, you know. <laughs> well, <I don't> know. <laughs> sounds like I've gotten better than you. Yeah, that sounds like I got... no, no, enjoy Cleveland. Exactly, right. No, no offense to Cleveland. but um, none, none whatsoever. And we built out a back office uh, in Poland. And so I spent a lot of time in Katowice, Poland, which yeah, is in yeah. Krakow, and um, just loved working with with the people in that office, we greenfielded an office in Singapore. So we started it from scratch we had an office in Hong Kong. I was spending a lot of time, you know, just kind of going all around EMEA and APAC, meeting with clients, meeting with prospects and just figuring out how are we going to position ourselves? How are we going to win in these markets? And it was just an amazing time. I mean, and I was the kind of wearing the GM hat. And we were growing the business and we were positioning ourselves really well as a global, as a global player. So it was fabulous. So tick the box, you know, international experience, tick the box. We moved back to the U.S. We moved to Nashville. And at that time, we were trying to sell the company. It did, that didn't happen. Right. Um, and then it, we went through this really interesting period of like three years where we lost a CEO our holding company went bankrupt. I spent six months on the road telling, convincing clients that it wasn't us going bankrupt. It was just the parent company. And that and it was just a really interesting time. Um, we were kind of rudderless, I would say. And then I got this opportunity to um, join a small private equity family office that was trying to build a smaller business in the screening space. And I joined them as CEO. And, you know, last box ticked, right? I, I finally made it. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, it was that in itself was an interesting journey because I had never really worked for a family office. Right. Um, different. And that's a very different dynamic than yes, working it is. in private equity or working, obviously, in a public company. 
And uh, I learned a whole lot there. Um, during the two years, we did a couple different deals and grew the business from $7 million to $70 million, which was amazing. Um, dealt with a lot of integration work, change management, scaling the company. Um, but it was really good experience of learning how to be an executive and managing a board, um, you know, managing the sort of the private equity owner. Um, and, and kind of really dealing with issues that I had never dealt with before, even in p previous P&L experiences, you know, you didn't have a lot of those same experiences because you, you know, you know, you kind of had a CEO and you had a board and you were a little bit separated from that. Um, great experience. I left that in 2019 and I took six months off. And at this time we had moved from Don't Nashville. Tell me you had your fifth kid. Like what? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Plants closed, right? At this point, what on? Plant is closed. Okay. Because um, you're so, in zone coverage, two and four. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's that's that no was, bueno. My wife did a good job of convincing me to have four. So, like, I was like, all right, good, we have four. Um, we moved from Nashville to San Diego, so I took six months off. We were living in Coronado, which oh, is nice. Yeah, yeah. Amazing place to live, and I took six months off and really took a step back. I mean, at that time I was, I guess this was about five years ago. So I was like in my late forties and I kind of just said to myself, like, what do you yeah. really want to do with your, yeah, you know, it was kind of like that, you know, sort of midlife inflection mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you call it a crisis. I didn't go buy a Porsche or anything like that. It was just kind of like, what, I think that was where I was like, what really does make you happy? You know, and I think it was a great time for me to just of introspection of just thinking like, what are the things that really matter to me after this whole journey of going from politics and policy and corp dev and strategy and sales and marketing and global and CEO and like, what, what do I really, what am I really looking for? You know, <laughs> and I spent um, a lot of time at Starbucks and on, uh, on Orange Avenue in Coronado. Uh, exactly which is where it is. Which and then I spent a lot of time surfing in the Pacific Ocean, yeah. all great places to for to you know to kind of find mm -hmm. yourself, right? Hundred percent. I spent a lot of time on the sidelines of my kids' football games. Um, I mean, I just I really just lived life, you know. I just took a step back and said, "What is this all about?" And I I literally started to write down the things that made me happy, you know. And the things that kind of brought me joy, whether it's in the workplace, like the kinds of people I like to work with, um, the environment I like to work in, um, you know, sort of what does the company look like that I'm interested? I mean, like just sketched out like this. Again, I told you guys I'm like a planner. So I had to yeah, yeah. Out your sketch next this thing out. And I kind of honed in on what I was looking for. And um, ironically, when I got you know, I was talking to the guys at Accurate about doing this, we were doing a deal with Career Builder. We were going to buy Career Builder's employment screen. And I came right. in on that as a consultant. And I said, yeah, let me, I got a chance, got a chance to kind of kick the tires before you buy, you know? Because yeah. mm -hmm. a lot of times when you jump into a job, you don't get to do that. I mean, you go through an interview process and I spend, you know, 30 minutes talking to you, William, and 30 minutes talking to you, Ryan. Like, but I have no idea how you really yeah. are, right? Right. Mm -hmm. I'm on my best behavior. Exactly. Yes. And so um, going through the deal and doing the deal and getting to know the management team, I really felt like, yeah, these are the kinds of people I want to work with. You know, this is the kind of culture that I'm aligned with. Um, and this is the kind of challenge that I'm interested in, right? Like we got to integrate these two businesses. They're about the same size. And then we got to build this go to market team from something that is, you know, it's fairly opportunistic to something that is repeatable and you know measurable and it's been a great experience um and i still think i want to get back into a ceo seat at some point because i think that that is something that is on my radar but I, again i think now i don't look at it as i'm chasing a position Sorry. right i'm i'm chasing an environment i'm chasing right. a culture i'm chasing an opportunity and what that looks like and I think for me, that was like the biggest kind of aha moment in my career so far is 
stepping away from chasing positions because I got really interested in that, you know, like, Oh, I got to be this and I got to be that, you know, (laughs) to then saying like, yeah, but what really does, you know, make you happy. And it's been great. That's, that's a great story. I followed the whole thing and I wanted to interrupt with a lot of questions and I just followed along. No, you I did too. On, you I took, did took too. Me on that journey today. Great yeah. story. We usually ask a ton I, of questions. Don't need to. No, I, I think the Ryan asked the question yesterday, though, which I thought was great. Oh, what would your, kid. yeah, what would your younger self say to your older self? So your sixteen or eighteen year old, you know, Dan, say to your, you know, oh no, your, younger, younger, like yeah. ten year old oh. self. What okay. would like your ten year old self tell tell Dan of today to keep in mind as you're going yeah. through life? Uh that's a well, that's a great question. I, I think, you know, one thing that I think my ten year old self would say is um, you know, m- maybe don't constrain your dreams a bit. You know, when I was mm-hmm. younger, I was I was fairly um I was I was kind of an introvert. Right. When I wasn't like this super sporty kid, I wasn't the most popular kid, you know, um, I was kind of hanging with everybody, but I wasn't, but I always was like a dreamer, you know, I loved to write and my 10 year old self would have said like, you're going to be a writer. Like that's what I want. I wanted to be when I was (laughs) 10 years old, I wanted to be a writer. And, um, I think that, you know, just, I think that person would say, you know, don't constrain your dreams, I think. And I think because you do, you do get, you can get kind of pigeonholed into what you think you want, right? right. And obviously, your our all, all of our environments shape that, right? Because they're sure. constantly telling us what we want or what we think <laughs> we want. And so I think that ten year old will be like, yeah, but you know, why don't you go be a, you know, this, that, or the other? Like, why are you constrained by? Yeah. You know, this. So I think that that's something that I kind of keep in the back of my mind. Um, yeah, I, I think that those are we could probably do shows upon shows on this with people. Just you, you've been through the journey. You've seen success. You oh, know no, there's still a lot more than a lot more of the journey to go. But yeah, well, sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. His mother's 91. One. I mean, what are you, 25? He's, you know, yeah. like, he's got he's time. Got, he's got a while. He's got yeah. plenty of time. But we often forget. Regardless of what level of success you have, you forget what you were at 10 years old yeah. and what your 10-year-old self would say if you asked him at 10 years old. What do you want to do? I want to be a writer. I want to be, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be an yeah. astronaut, right. But there's <laughs> dreams, right? Now, the job might be a little far-fetched, but right. the dream behind that job is real. And oh, I, I think, it broke I think my we heart. I, I did a bit for uh, – it's a nonprofit where you – you teach for a day, so you go into a you know kindergarten or I think this was like <laughs> second what grade I want or something. You teaching my kindergarten. Oh yeah. So <laughs> I came. In, I came in. No, no qualifications involved. <laughs> Zero. No, I had actually taught undergraduates, but oh, all right. God. So I asked him. I said, okay. So uh, obviously, all y'all are thinking about college. College. What you know? What colleges are you thinking about? Like what names are kind of being you know? It's and. All of them were thinking about community college. And this was like second grade. I'm like, okay. So first of all, let's take all the community colleges and let's throw them out the window. Okay. And let's start thinking about Harvard, Stanford, University (laughs) of Texas. Let's start thinking. Let's. You you shouldn't have the bar lowered in second grade. Right. (laughs) That was my point to him. Like, let's think bigger than that because you're going to be better than that. So you might you might go to community college. That's fantastic. You know, a lot of people do. Yeah, that's that exactly. (laughs) But let's set the bar. It's second grade now. In you know, eleventh grade. Okay. It starts getting a little. Yeah, the window gets a little smaller, right? Yeah, it does. Right, but not in second grade. (laughs) But it broke. It literally broke my heart. But oh my gosh, yeah, Dan. You've you've been absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for uh, being on the show and sharing your journey with us. We just really appreciate you.